Randy Reck. Welcome to the Boardroom Podcast. It's good to see you. A um, couple things. The first thing is, I don't know if you're aware, but Kelly Slater has retired from pro surfing. It's official. The word came out of his mouth. He had his last heat yesterday at Margaret River. He obviously didn't advance. Um, a lot's been said about Kelly Slater, Randy, through uh, his career, but you've been very close to Kelly and Kelly's career. career. What are your thoughts on, on Kelly Sl Slater? his retirement and his legacy? Well, I think there'll never be another Kelly Slater. I mean, the term goat greatest of all time applies to him, no question about it. And I think, uh, you know, I've known Kelly since he was, I think first time out here to Hawaii he was like 12 or 13 years old and put him in all the different events during the triple crown, handed him a lot of paychecks over the years. And, uh, you know, Back in the day when the uh, WSL was awarded here in Hawaii, the you know world title, I uh, handed him a couple of his world title trophies, as well as I think he won the Triple Crown three times. I think it was something like that. So I don't think you'll find another surfer that matches Kelly's record and everything. I always just kind of like to joke though. The one thing he failed to do was win a contest here at Sunset Beach, and he always rubs him the wrong way when I say Kelly, you didn't complete your career without a win at Sunset. So. Uh, <laughs> That's one the, the one thing on the checklist that he was never able to check. But yeah. I think Kelly did more for surfing than than any individual since Duke Hanamoku for sure. Wow, well, that's that's um that's high praise and well deserved. You know, it's funny I think about Kelly and we think about his competitive uh, prowess. But I tell you what, he's such a um he's such a great ambassador for the sport. Like the way that he speaks, the way that he carries himself, he's just and he's been. And he's put himself out there. You know, there's others that have sort of like, and I think of Tiger Woods as a great example. He doesn't really put himself out there. Kelly has really uh, worn his emotions on his sleeve and has invited us all into that. Yeah, I think um, he's been, a, like I said, a great ambassador. And if you think back at the other world champions, guys like, say, Tom Curran, you know, Tom was an amazing surfer, but he wasn't a very good uh, ambassador to the sport. Uh, other guys like Damian Hardman and, um, you know, on and on that that have won over the years, and um, they didn't really project other than their surfing. And whereas Kelly has covered the whole spectrum. He's been, you know, I, I remember at the Pipe Masters when we finished the contest, or before a, a heat or after a heat of his, he would stand there and sign autographs, and he would engage with his fans, and he really people related to that. They went, they could see, as you said, that he was trying to project himself as well as surfing and he, he was just a, a terrific ambassador and like I said over all those years he's traveled around the world and nobody else I think has carried surfing like Kelly Slater has and uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the WSL does with it because if you look at somebody like John 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 John's an amazing surfer or uh, Gabby or Italo those guys are all great surfers but have they been able to project the interest of the fan base that you know Kelly has no so it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens now. Will surfing lose some of its enthusiasm because we've lost Kelly Slater? I mean, I think you're going to see him still surf in a couple of select events. So he's not going to disappear altogether. Yeah, for sure. He basically mentioned Pipe and Chopu as events that he would like to get wild cards into. He didn't use those words, but that's it was very obvious. But those are the events that he sort of cherishes to be in. And uh, we certainly hope to see him in those. And that brings me to the Olympics because I've been sort of, you know, for lack of a better phrase, just kind of like pushing the thought that Kelly just gets a wild card into the Olympics. I mean, that if you're on the, the International Olympic Committee, you're just going, why isn't Kelly Slater in my contest? You know what I mean? Like, this is the guy that everyone knows, and he sure. certainly could win at Chopu. Yeah, I mean, it it would be really, really good for surfing if somehow, and I don't know the mechanics of that because I'm not really involved with the ISA, if there's any way possible that he could get in, because I think he would be the you know, the plum uh, on the, you know, the Sunday there, because without him, you know, people are going to go, like I said, you know, Gabby and, and John, John and, and, you know, uh, Cole Pinto, those guys are all really great surfers. There's no question about that. And I think for the hardcore fan base, that'll be fine. But I think for the kind of average guy, it's, if you have a Kelly Slater and even if it's one last hurrah, it certainly would be great for the Olympics. And I'm not sure, you know, who makes that decision, but it, it would be a smart one to make. I agree. And I've actually gone into the weeds on it. And um, certainly there's, you know, ways that you qualify for the team and Kelly has not qualified. But, but when you think about like, 
like when the dream team and I think it was in the nineties, maybe it was 92. Um, the first Olympic dream team, like they just cherry picked the best guys in the world. And, and they, you know, Michael Jordan didn't have to qualify. He was just picked, you know yeah. what I mean? And so it'd be neat if they just somehow found some sort of way to slide Kelly in. And I know it would be great for TV for sure. Yeah. No, no question about that. Well, we'll see what happens. Talk to Fernando. <laughs> Well, uh, look, you just got back. You had a trip to Australia. Tell me a little bit about your trip to Australia. What happened down there? Well, you know, it was really interesting. I uh, had a, about 10 day kind of window and my wife gave me a hall pass to go somewhere. She said, why don't you go surf with the boys somewhere? And so a, a good buddy and I decided to go down to Australia and I was calling it my farewell tour because I don't think I'll be getting back to Australia anytime soon. I'm not really involved with the uh, contest anymore. So I thought, oh, a good excuse to go. So it was really a who's who of legends from Australian surfing. I started off in Sydney, stayed with Jack McCoy, who was famous for McCoy Hool films, made a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, great surf movies. Then I went up a little bit farther up the coast and stayed with um, Wayne Lynch. Wayne and I had known each other since he was 16 years old and was a teenage phenom back in the day. From there, I went and surfed Angari, and then I got to stay with Nat Young. Nat lives right at Angari, so Nat and I got caught up. He took me to the Yamba Pub and showed me all these classic boards that he's got hanging on the wall in the Yamba Pub, which is great. And then from there, I went up to um, Lennox Head, Broken Head, and, and then Byron Bay and uh, checked in with Bob McTavish. I was actually supposed to be doing a, uh, a talk story, and uh, they had about 500 people showed up for the talk story. And unfortunately, due to a little bit of an incident, I didn't show up. But uh, a couple of days later, I, I was back talking with Mac, and we uh, spent about six hours together and whatever, and spent a couple of afternoons with George Greeno. Then I saw Rusty Miller, and I saw Gunter Roon, I saw Dickie Hool. It was really a classic uh, trip up the coast of Australia. Well, that sounds great. And um, got me thinking about competitive surfing and competitive surfers. And when we speak about Kelly Slater, and I thought to myself, who's going to win a contest? Nat Young, 1968 Nat Young versus, you know, 19, uh, let's say, 95 Kelly Slater. I mean, talk about competitive beasts. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Well, Nat, you know, back in the late 60s was in, in 69, he won the surfer pole. He was considered the best surfer in the world. He, of course, won the world championships in 66 in San Diego and then uh he reinvented himself with a new longboard air and won the longboard championships in the eighties. And he is still an animal as they call him. That's his nickname because he goes like that. And unfortunately he had um, some health issues and he's not surfing anymore. So he's really frustrated that he, you know, he's hoping that, that he can recover and, and possibly get back in the water, but we'll see on that one. But it's interesting, all those legends, you know, like I said, Wayne Lynch, not young, Bob McTavish, those guys, and particularly George Greeno, I spent a couple of afternoons with Greeno. You know, those are the guys that ushered in the modern shortboard air. They were responsible for the movement from longboards to shortboards. And they're still pretty active, like McAvish especially. He's got a great factory at Byron Bay. And, and they're still keen on what's going on. And they keep it on top of uh, what's contemporary surfing. Well, it's, I'm glad you brought that up because one of my questions for you is, in your opinion, who and what was the genesis for the shortboard revolution? Um, and maybe you, maybe it's unfair to have you pick one person. Is it that simple or is it more nuanced than that? It's definitely more nuanced. I think you, ha you have to look at you know, the time period from 67 to 69, which is really the, from the longboard to the shortboard, what we call the shortboard revolution. Um, George Greeno, a kneeboarder, went to Australia and inspired those guys to change their lines on surfing. You know, there was a, a surf movie that was made out of Australia called Going Vertical, which really describe what their idea was to come off the bottom and go up to the top and, and use the, the wave up and down rather in a linear state line. At that stage, David Nuevo was the best surfer in California and nose riding was king. Nat came along in 66, kind of blew that out and things began to change. But I think Greeno get, was a genesis. And then I personally give Bob McTavish really the, the guy who started the ball rolling. He came to Hawaii in 67 went out in the Duke meet on his big V bottom. And while he failed miserably as a competitor, what he did, it opened up the eyes of all these guys, went over to Maui, hooked up with Brewer. Brewer had the pintail. Brewer made the mini pins and combined some V into it. So 
Brewer was already working on shorter boards and then McTavish, you know, really was a shot across the bow that opened everything up. So I, I think those, you know, McTavish I credit with, with really getting the ball rolling and then Brewer taking it from there and, you know, rest is history. You know, it's funny that the, the, um, the discussion about McTavish at Sunset Beach and the V bottoms not working, I, I think it sort of gets brushed over that he, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but he showed up on this steamer from Australia. He rolled up to the North Shore. They basically threw him into a heat. He waxed the board up. He didn't even practice. And and he wiped out a couple of times. But, I mean, he was, you know, it wasn't like he put the board through its paces an afternoon in blue eight-foot sunset. He got one heat and he kind of fell because it was, you know, fresh off the jet. And proof of that is that he went to Honolulu. And the boards worked pretty damn good. I mean, people were blown away just, you know, a week later or whatever. Yeah, well, you got a little bit of uh, mix up on some of the history there. I mean, Matt, <laughs> Matt came in back in 63 on a, a steamer and right. spent time on the North Shore. And he was kind of a he was a stowaway and they actually ended up arresting him. That was a funny story, but he loved Sunset Beach. And so he really wanted to come back. He got invited back for the Duke meet. He came in 67. I actually went to the airport picked up McTavish's board came in later. I drove with Mac from the air, from the North shore to the airport, picked up his V bot and brought it back. And then I was watching that contest and I was standing next to Dewey Weber and McTavish went down, laid it over on that V panel and the thing skidded about three foot, the fin caught and he went vertical back up, got, you know, knocked off in the lip. But I remember looking over at Dewey and go, Whoa, something's happening here. It was a completely different line than, all the Hawaiians were doing really clean lines on their pintails, but all of a sudden it's there. And so really, um, I, I have to, like I said, McTavish is the guy who opened the door for it. The board wasn't suited for Sunset Beach. In fact, he, that board was longer. He was riding eight foot boards already in Australia, but because for Hawaii he says, well, we need a bigger board for the more powerful wave. So he took it back up to nine foot, but it had the big giant wide pod V tail that the concept was there. And then, like you said, they went to Honolulu and they made the boards work. The, you, know, you know, they had to make the boards work, but the boards did work in a way that was unlike anything else. Brewer was there, Reno was there, Jerry was there. They were all, like I said, riding pintails and drawing these nice, nice clean lines, but just going laterally where he's just going vertical. And so that's what really what changed it. Yeah. And, and Nat obviously was surfing those boards well during that session as well. Well, Nat could, Nat could ride an ironing board and, uh, he uh he really made it look good. And if you look at the next winter, Nat came back and just ripped the North Shore. I mean, surfed it really, really well. And uh, like I said, he went on to get the cover of Surfer Magazine, was a Surfer Pole winner, and uh he surfed in the Duke meet. And it was it was really impressive to see Nat, you know, with a better board and what he could do with it. But yeah. that was all, you know, it's all inspired by Greeno. I, I give Greeno the credit for really lighting a fuse and then brewer here in Hawaii took it from there and really refined it. Yeah. Well, uh, interesting times. And, and we certainly, as we shift this conversation a bit to vintage collectible surfboards and the surfboard market, um, we have some boards that sort of reflect that era, but I'd like to start this conversation with the concept of the most valuable board in the marketplace and your professional estimation what is the most valuable board that's that's available? And um, I'd like to hear your thoughts there. Well, availability is the thing. You know, what's available and uh, what's it worth? I mean, if you had Duke Kahanamoku's board, to me, that would be the ultimate board. And the trouble is that the known Duke boards are all in possession of a museum or a private hands, and they're not going to ever be sold. So, you know, you'd have to say a certified Duke board would have to be it. Then if you move into... But hold yeah. on, let me ask you this. Let's sure. say for whatever reason, hypothetically, one of those Duke boards becomes available on the marketplace. What kind of price estimation would we be putting on those boards, on one of those boards? Based on what's sold, you'd have to start it at $100,000. You know, and that may be, actually may be even too cheap. Um, I'd say one hundred to 250000 would be the price range that a board like that would go for. The most expensive board I think that's sold in auction has been, a, um, I believe, a Curran. And uh, we, when I was doing the Hawaiian Island Vintage Surf Auction back in the 2000s, we had a John Kelly that went for 42000 
Um, Akern's been in that $40,000 range. Uh, Kivlin. Um, so you, the designers, you have to realize then, uh, the other thing is you have to put it into eras. You know, is it a wood board or is it a foam board? And that, de you know, determines because foam boards were much more prolific than wood boards. So in my opinion, wood boards are worth more um, because there was less of them and they were handmade. They weren't you know, production made. And as we got into balsa, then we got into foam boards. There was a, a lot more boards out there. So it's kind of like a, a car. You know, if you find a Duesenberg that they only made six of them, it's going to be worth a heck of a lot more than a 12-cylinder Duesenberg that they made 600 of them. So it's simple as that. What about the um, Quig Darlin board? Does that board exist or is it nobody knows where it is? Like the original getting... one that, that Tommy Zahn had Quig make for Darlin Zucker, who right. was Daryl Zucker's teenage daughter. You know, that's one of those classic boards that if you could find it, it would be worth a lot of money because that started the whole Malibu chip air. And that board, you know, really opened up eyes and what have you. Another one that um, I think would be worth a lot of money would be Nat Young's 1966 Sam board that he rode because that changed the direction of surfing. And ironically, the last person to see that board was myself. I saw it came to Surfline Hawaii. I fixed the dings on it because um, Nat had left it with Harbor with Steve Bigler and, and they were the dealer in Hawaii with Surfline. They sent it over. I took a look at it. But that time, the board was obsolete as far as a surfboard. But in terms of, you know, significance, it was. Why Why was that? Why did it lose? Its, was it a, like sort of a mini V bottom or something like that? Or It was a real soft rolled V and mm -hmm. boards, you know, got much better than after that. I mean, who made who made that board? McTavish? No, no, that was uh, Nat himself actually shaped that board. And mm -hmm. it was really thin and it was patterned after McTavish's uh, basic, you know, soft V bottom. And it was really thinned out. And so really what it was was the type of surfing that Nat did on it as opposed to the, the board itself was a crappy board. It wasn't a very good board, but, you know, Nat made it work. Yeah. Hmm. So there, well, there's there's other ones like that. Like I said, you know, any current gun, uh, you know, a Pat current gun, if you can find an original one, it's going to be worth a ton of money. If you can find one of the remake ones that were done about 15, 20 years ago that they made a, I think a total run of about 30 of those all together those are going to be worth really good money. So any gun, any big wave elephant gun is going to be worth good money. And if you've got the provenance of who wrote it, who shaped it, and photos of it being ridden, then for sure, that's going to be a high dollar board. And like I said, other wood boards that are out there in the market, you know, if you've got the provenance between a really good wood board, that's going to be worth high dollars because they only made a few of them. What about... Um the Simmons boards, because I've heard some suggest to me that the Simmons single fins may have more value than the Simmons twin fins because of the scarcity factor. There just aren't as many. Bob quickly went to this twin fin design. Yeah, well, that it's, it's interesting because that was the late 40s when those boards were being made and they had the foam sandwich in between with a plywood on the top and balsa rails. And a lot of people don't know that uh, Matt Kivlin and Joe Quigg actually produced those boards for Simmons, and they were putting the rails on and shaping them. And then what Quigg did, he started putting tail rocker in it, and Simmons got really pissed off at him because he said, no, 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 these boards got to be straight because they'll go faster at Malibu. And and Quigg said, no, no, but when you go into the bottom and you want to turn it, you, you need some rocker in it. And and Simmons and him, they actually had a falling out because of that. And it's really interesting. So Single fin could be more worth more simply because they're rarer. Like you said, there's more twin fins out there. I think the last one that I saw that was really good was once again back in the 2000s when I did my auction. And it was one that I'd gotten from uh, James Arness. And that thing was flawless. I don't think it had ever even been ridden. It was just beautiful board. So a bo any any Simmons that's a documented Simmons is going to be worth more. The, and of course, the better condition it's in, the more it's going to be worth. Funny story. I had a falling out with my shaper about tail rocker just a couple of weeks ago. So <laughs> to this day, tail rocker is a problem. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's what's uh, what, what makes us all go around. Yeah, exactly. You know, in, in fact, just on that, when I was down in Australia a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about McTavish because Yader has a thing so, where the bottom should always be a continuous curve. There should be no sp straight spots at all. And you, that curve can be a, a huge curve, like imagine a giant ball or even a small little ball for a tighter curve. 
And McTavish and I got in a big argument about it. He said, no, 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 you don't need the curve. You need straight to make go fast. And we got in an, an argument about the same thing. So I think surfboard design is what, this is what I tell people. People ask me, why do I restore boards? You know, why do I care about the vintage thing? The history of our sport is laid out in the timeline of all these designs. And, and surfboards come and go. And I, like I say, people, it goes like an oval. It moves forward, then it comes back and picks up some of the past. That gets it reapplied, and then that moves forward again. So it's just, contemporary surfing is a, an oval. It's always moving forward. And so if you have these boards and you take a look at them and you know what's happening, you can see where to progress from it. So to look at a, a series of boards, you know, from the turn of the century to now, you can see what the, the progress of surfing is totally depicted in the art of surfboards. And that's why it's so important to keep these things restored, collectible, and so people can appreciate them. You know, it's interesting as you say that, I think to myself, these periods in that timeline that that sort of went quick, especially during the shortboard revolution, right. there was changes every month, probably. I mean, you know, I wasn't there, but, and so I say to myself, well, if we're going back, there's a lot of stuff that got touched on and then quickly shelved because, well, it didn't work, but there's probably some great ideas there. And McTavish, the board that he did with Steph Gilmore recently is sort of like that. Like he went and revisited that original V bottom, but of course he made it, you know, more modern and more surfable. And, and there's probably a lot of little moments throughout that shortboard revolution that we could now go back and just kind of spend a little bit more time thinking about some of those design ideas. Well, that's, that's really interesting because I tell people that you should go to know where you're going. You got to know where you've been. So if you understand the designs of the past, you can apply certain aspects of it. I'll give you a quick little example. Uh, my stepson is a really good server here on the North shore. His shaper came over, laid down this board. And he says, this is the latest thing. Look at this. This is what's happening. And I said, hmm, hang on a second. I went into my shaping room, came back out, unrolled this uh, paper template, laid it on top of the board, and it was identical to the T. I mean, it was like, and he looked at that and he went, oh, my God. I said, yeah, I shaped that 30 years ago. So <laughs> it just goes to show you what goes around and it comes around. And, it, and it's really interesting to uh but if you know that, and, and like the example you just gave of McTavish, you know, reinventing an old design and applying, you know, new rock or new rail techniques. And, and certainly the other thing that's really great now is, is the um, technology of how, you know, the boards are being built with, you know, all the epoxies and, and different quality materials. You can make a board strong and light and, and it's just neat. So I tell people, I said, no, like I said, know where you've been. You're going to know where you're going. So interesting, this concept, this conversation you had with Bob, where he was saying, look, there might be some flat spots that aren't a bad idea. You're thinking, look, constant curve. I think downing was big on constant curve. Um, flat spots. And now you're starting to mess with some stuff. You got to get it right, you know, and um, I don't know. It's fascinating. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. I mean, like Randy Yader, you know, I to me is one of the best shapers ever in the world and he's still with us he's still actually shaping a couple of boards in his 90s now but randy is like i said the idea of a constant curve in your rocker and it's the same thing with brewer just, just the opposite started applying concaves you know to, be, to get lift and lift speed and so it's it's a combination of how do you do the, the two so you know mctavish likes the idea of a flat you know randy likes the idea of a constant you know gradual curve and it can be a really slight curve so it can be almost dead flat but same thing with george with downing uh i i learned a certain shape from george and he always felt you know make him neutral enough that anybody could ride him don't make him so extreme or so radical so you know different schools of thought and everything works it's kind of like do you like a blonde do you like a brunette you know they're both good but you know everything works to some extent for everybody yeah, agreed. You know, George Downing's a, a great name um, regarding vintage surfboards. You know, there's, there, those are sort of holy grail boards to find a, an older George Downing shaped board. Um, doesn't seem like I see a lot of those come across my desk. What about you? Do you see Downings from say the fifties? Uh, are yeah. there any floating around out there or are they all owned by his sons? He didn't, he didn't make that many. George wasn't a very prolific shaper. And he, would, he made boards for himself and his friends. He wasn't making boards from a production capacity in any way, shape, or form. And if you do come across a downing, like I said, the lines are super clean. They're very unassuming. And it's ironic. I'm actually working on one right now in my uh, restoration room. 
It's a, a Georgetown is semi, and I was actually admiring looking at it. it. Had down rails in the back and a real soft roll in the front, and so speedy but very forgiving. And Keone, his son, still has four of George's, actually five of George's original boards. And you know, he said if some well-heeled collector wanted to come along and pay him two hundred fifty thousand dollars, he would let those five boards go. So he's putting a fifty thousand dollar value on a Downing. So if you can come across a clean downing it's, that particularly was made for Makaha Point, um, that's a, a, a holy grail board for sure. And those boards that Keone has and the one that you're working on, those are wood? Uh, there's a couple balsam ones and a couple foam ones that Keone has. One I have is a foam one. It was uh, when George was working with Charlie Galento at the uh, Greg Knoll shop here in Honolulu. And I actually, that's when I learned how to shape. I was a repair guy back in the 60s in those days. And George showed me you know, basically my how to turn a rail and what have you. So it has a Greg Knoll logo, which is Greg Knolls are always really popular. And if you have a Greg Knoll downing, you're talking some major, major value and something like that. There's not too many of those downing no. knolls, right? That's there's they only made about 12 of them, you know. And it's funny because <laughs> uh Greg went ahead and printed this logo that said George Downing model, and George didn't know about it. George came in and saw it on the rack, you know, being laminated. He goes, what the hell is this? And blew up at Greg. And it actually was a bit of a fallout between the two of them. So if you find one that has a Greg Knoll and George Downing on it, you're talking to some, you know, major collectability just because of the rarity of it. Yeah. Interesting. What about Joe Quigg? Quigg, we mentioned him earlier. Um, I think he, he's obviously in Hawaii. He's, he's, he's revered and well-known. It seems like he flies under the radar a little bit regarding the collectible market. I, th I think what happened there was Joe was so unassuming that when he had his manufacturing uh, going on down there in Newport Beach, he didn't make that many boards. And he was sort of in the shadow of Velzy back in those days. He told me a story where he designed fins that were more raked and he would put them forward, move them up on the board so he'd have more area behind the fin. And Velzy was putting his fins right on the tail and hanging over the tip of the tail. And Joe was moving his forward, made his boards much looser, but because Velzy was more popular, he couldn't sell his boards with a fin up. So he had to move the fin back to the tail just to mimic Velzy. And he grumbled. He goes, you know, it's making the boards terrible. But he says, it's the only way I can sell the darn thing. So I don't think, and he didn't he didn't advertise in like Surfer Magazine back in the day. That's how you, you got your word out there. He didn't do that. He had a couple minor ads, but very few of them. And then he moved to Hawaii and started building boats. And so he kind of dropped off the surfboard radar scene, ended up making insane boats over here for Joey Cabell and a couple other guys, you know, catamarans and stuff and uh, paddle boards. He got really into paddle boards. The quick paddle boards are insane paddle boards. And so he didn't get the accolades that a lot of the other guys got. He didn't get the promotional value. But from a design point of view, I put Quig in the top three designers in the world, no question about it. And and who are these? Who are these other two? Well, you know, once again, you can split hairs on on airs, but I I would have to say, I give Downing definitely credence for designing you know the first really good Makaha Point boards. Uh, under him, we're talking about unsung guys was Wally Froisa. Wally taught George how to shape, and then they in turn you know inspired a bunch of younger guys of course dick brewer in my opinion is the most prolific of all the you know big wave shapers and and he learned from bob shepherd who had actually making better boards than tom or uh, pat kern was in the day pat was a great surfboard rider and he made guns for waimea but his guns really only worked for him if you look there's not that many guys that were riding the current guns and brewer had surfboards hawaii and he was like i said inspired by um, Bob Shepard and a lot more guys were riding his guns than anybody else's. So I'd say Brewer for sure. So we've got Brewer and we've got Downing and we've got Quig. Those are your top three. I think for, for big wave type of boards and, yeah. and, you know, speedy Hawaiian type shape. Now, if you want to talk small wave boards, it's a whole nother deal. And then once again, you have to look at what, are you talking longboard air or are you talking shortboard air? So in the, you know, longboard air, in, what we talked about McTavish, I think McTavish is regarded as who heralded, you know, the, the shortboard air. So I'd have to put McTavish right up in the top of the heap there as well. And then, you know, then you switch shift to shortboards and you're going to you get into guys like Rusty and, 
Al Merrick and, you know, uh, on and on and on. I mean, there's yeah. plenty of good shapers in, in the shortboard category. Um, you, you mentioned as we talk about like incredible surfboard designers and a guy jumps out at me as, as sort of a design savant almost. And I feel like a lot of the really good guys aren't good marketers, you know, like these guys, like Quig's kind of like that. Like he just wasn't a very good marketer, you know what I mean? Sure. And I would suggest you maybe Pat Curran, we all know he's kind of quiet and, you know, in a shell. I don't see him handing out business cards in the parking lot at YMA Bay. You know what I'm saying? So, but the guy I'm thinking of is Tom Moray. I, I feel I, he's like a forward thinker, you know, and Tom Moray, I, I sense, of course, everyone knows the Moray boogie board, but I don't know if he gets the credit that he deserves. Give me some insight there, an anecdote or two about Tom Moray and his surfboard designs. Well, you know, I totally agree with you on this point because Maury in the late 50s was actually a really good surfer. And then into the early 60s, he started manufacturing surfboards. A lot of people don't realize that. He had a shop up in, in Ventura called Australian Surf Shop, which lasted for about a year or so. And then that morphed into Maury Surfboards, which then morphed into Maury Pope. And I think because they were up in Ventura, those guys didn't get the coverage that the guys down in, in the South Bay and, of course, Orange County got because of Surfer Magazine and the early promotional value. So, and if you look at, you know, it's funny you talk about this because I just published a story that's coming out in the next two weeks in Pacific Longboard, which is a um, Australian publication, uh, on, about Maury Pope's early years. And Tom got together with Carl Pope and came up with the Maury Pope boards, which included the Trisec, which is a three-piece surfboard. They came out with Slipcheck, which was a traction spray that everybody ended up using in the mid-60s. They had um, the first turn-down rails. Everybody thought they were too weird because they were uh, a wingtip nose, like an airplane wing, and he had that. He applied that to a bunch of different models. And then Bob Cooper, who had been Australian back and was influenced by the Aussies, came up with a blue machine. So really, I think Maury Popes are the most unsung collectible boards on the market today. If you can find a clean Maury Pope, you've got something that's unique and different. And if you look at the shape and the design, they were really forward thinking. So I think Tom Maury, as you said, that started this thing didn't get the accolades that he did before he invented the Maury boogie board. Well, you know, um, I'm not sure, you know, our auction ends here on Saturday. This will get published in a couple of days. Um, there's a, there's a peck penetrator in this thing that you, you brought it up to my attention that this is the only colored peck penetrator that you've ever seen. All of the peck penetrators that are in the market that we know of are just clear foam with the two stringers. So, is yeah, there I mean, another it, colored peck penetrator in the world? Or is this the only one we've ever seen? That's the only one I've seen. I talked to Blinky, who worked for Tom Moore. He was the first employee of Maury Pope, and he still is a shaper and William Dennis surfboards up there. And um, Blinky actually told me they had yellow and they had blue. And those were the two tints that, and he did all the gloss work on that. And he said, to his recollection, he can't remember even doing that one, but it, it's, a, it's a factory blue. So I said, well, Blinky, you must have done it. And he goes, well, I, I guess I did. But he says they are all clear. So to find a peck penetrator that has a blue tint makes it really unique. And then also in the auction of people that you know go to California Gold, the other one that's insane is the, is the uh, blue machine. And Bob Cooper designed that as a counter to some of the other boards that were out there at the time. And he, you, there's really a lot of changes. That this blue machine is a later version one when the slip check got really popular, and they did the doily, the psychedelic sprays, and and uh, this one is is super neat. So once again, it's a typical Maury Pope, different than anything else out there. And I'd say that the color work on that uh, blue machine that's in the auction is is got to be amazing. I mean, I, yeah. I haven't seen anything like that, and. You know, to me, that's that's kind of one of those boards. That if you're going to have a blue machine, you have one that looks like this. The only other ones I know of, they're like that, where it was about three of them that are made that uh, Cooper did his own artwork on them. And I think a collector out in Texas has one of those right now. And, you know, to me, that's a $10,000 surfboard. And so, you know, we'll see what they go for. Yeah. Well, another board that's in this auction that I, I find kind of interesting is this Conrad Conha. Um, it, it's his personal board. It's all black, which is in Hawaii, makes you scratch your head a little bit. And it was shaped by Sparky. And 
Sparky's one of these sort of unsung heroes in my eyes. I, I know in Hawaii that you older school guys know exactly who he is. He was around forever, but maybe give the listeners a little insight into both Conrad Kanha and Sparky and his his run at Surfline and his place in history there. Yeah, well, there here in Hawaii back in the sixties, there really was only two manufacturers. There was Surfboards Hawaii and there was Inner Island Surf Shop. Those are the only two labels that had a proper factory. There was all this, a couple smaller guys like. Bob Shepard was making swim boats and um, there was Fred surfboards in Wahiwa. And there's a couple other little ones here and there, but the two major manufacturers were surfboards Hawaii, which was Brewer and then inner Island surf shop, which was Mickey Lake. And then he had a couple different shapers diff shaped for him for a while uh, when diff would come over from the mainland, a couple other shapers, but a guy Sparky um, is Robert Schufel and his name was Sparky because he is a really eccentric character. I mean, he was a, a prankster, a good surfer, and he, he was an excellent designer. What a lot of people don't realize that Sparky is the guy who invented the concave nose, where he created that in the early 60s. And then it caught on and Phil Edwards applied that to the nose riders that he made for the Tom Mori Invitational in 1965 that uh, both Minos and, and, and Corky went on. So he's kind of a, an innovator himself that he came up with a concave nose. And he shaped for Inner Island for years and years and years. And then when Inner Island merged into what was called Surfboards Makaha, and that's when actually Ben Ipa got his start there. Sparky moved on and he worked for Greg Knoll for a while. And there was a spark. If you can find a Sparky Greg Knoll model, that's another highly collectible board. And Sparky worked for Greg Knoll. And then shortboards started coming in and he, he began to work for Surfline Hawaii and sort of the transition from longboards to shortboards. So here in Hawaii, super well-known, super highly regarded. And the fact that it's actually pronounced Con Conrad Kanha, like C-A-N, Kanha. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Conrad was a little Portuguese guy that was a, a dock worker. He worked at, at you know unloading the, the ships and stuff. And he basically was a, a real rascal himself and he was uh, really well known. He won the Peru Invitational. He won the Makaha Invitational, and Sparky shaped all his boards for him. And he, it was interesting because he went for these black surfboards, which was, you know, like I said, for being in Hawaii, it seemed pretty odd to have a black board. But it, he loved the fact that it looked like a, a, a black knight. He said, and he would put his fins hanging over the tail block. He put the fins right on the tail of the board. And the tip of the fins would hang over the tailback. And he said, oh, I want to have a rooster tail. So when I get into the tube, it's a, it's a, the water's off the tip of the tail. Make me go fast, you know? So Conrad was really well, well-liked, well-known. And he won a, a lot of tournaments over here. And I actually got a chance at the Alamana State Meets when I won the Hawaii Junior Championships. He won the, the Senior Men's Championships. So Conrad and I got to know each other really well. And uh, the fact that we have one of his boards available is pretty rare. Those things are hard to find, believe me. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about um, learning more about him as I dig into sort of his past. And, and it's been a lot of fun. Um, we do have a hot curl, um, a David Klausmeyer hot curl that's it's absolutely gorgeous, in my opinion. It's it's a Bishop Museum quality piece. I know you've seen it. Uh, it came from Oahu, I believe, from the West Side. Um, can you give me some insight into that David Klausmeyer hot curl? And maybe some. You mentioned Froiseth and George. Um, their their input into this design. Yeah. So I, I mentioned earlier when we were talking about you know what boards are valuable. I said wood boards, and this is a real consensual example of that. David Klausmeyer lived right on the beach at Makaha and his um, family moved over here from Europe. I think it was via the mainland and his dad set up, I think he, he was involved with the plantations if I remember right. And David, his son, you know, became a surfer because they lived right on the beach next to Makaha and the breakout in front of their house became known as Claus Myers because their their house was on a beach. So, like many of a place, you know, you get named after you know whatever's close by. The Claus Meyer house was on the beach, the peak out in front, right across the channel from a cob, became known as Claus Myers. Well, that particular board was made at the Outrigger Club in Honolulu, and it was influenced by um, John Kelly and and Wally Froissett. And it was redwood and I believe pine, I think, of the stringers. It had like four pine stringers. Um, and 
it's hollowed out. That board is chambered out. So a lot of work went into it. And the tail is really pulled in as a hot curl, which was the influence of John Kelly. So I'm, I'm guessing that board, nobody knew for sure, but it was made probably in the late 40s, early 50s, maybe 52 at the latest, I would say. Um, and I'm not sure about that because that's about the time the the hot curls. We, we have 42 on the in the catalog. 40, sorry, sorry, I meant, meant to say 42, late 30s, or early 40s, you know, when, uh, and so it's really pulled in in the tail because it was designed for Makaha. And if you look at the rocker of that thing, it's got a really nice straight uh, tail that blends into sort of a rolled V in the tail, which allowed them to turn. There's no fin on the board. And the fact that it was chambered that early on to get some lightness in the thing. And the guy that had that board was it, it, in the Klausmar family donated it to a guy that worked on their house. And he was a woodworker. Uh, construction kind of handyman type guy. And they gave him the old board. By this stage, you know, they all thought it was just a piece of junk. And the guy had the board for a number of years. And then he worked with um, the guy who glued up all of Dick Brewer's boards, a guy named Bones. And Bones took it, took the board apart, cleaned it all up and glued it back together again. And the board just came out immaculate once it was cleaned up. So that's a, a good example of a board that's been refurbished to the point where it looks like it should have when it was brand new and that's one of the a holy grail type of boards because of the history of it being the claus Myers family board david claus Myers initials are on the board you know it was worked on with a guy like bones who did the, the cleanup work on the thing so you've got a board that is showroom quality it's like taking like i said a, a ferrari or a Duesenberg and and having it completely dialed in and putting it in one of the Barrett Jackson auto auctions and know that on the Saturday afternoon, this is going to be a board that's going to go for a lot of money. So if somebody had the money and wanted to really have a piece of history, you, you've got one of the boards that they, they definitely should have. No, there's no question on that. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm thankful that it's been chambered. My back is thankful that it's been chambered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that thing, you know, if it hadn't been chambered, it probably would have weighed twice as much, you know, so... Did did we find out that it was chambered when when it was uh, when Bones did some work on it? Or did yeah, because basic board? when when Bones got the board, the board was in, in terrible condition. It had fallen apart and had delaminated. All the stringers had just fallen. You know, yeah. It, 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 the guy had it laying in against the side of his house, and the, the you know thirty years worth of weathering. It just sort of basically deteriorated to the point. So. It's been, uh, like I said, glued back up by Bones. He's a master, you know, craftsman as far as coming to wood. And then it's been oiled, I think, with eight coats of oil, which is how they sealed them to make them waterproof back then. There's no fiberglass on the board, no resin on the board at all. It's just yeah. you know, pure natural oil and it's sealing the, the wood and keep the water out. Pretty cool. There's, there's also um, uh, a Lopez that Jerry made um, I, sometime in the late sixties, trying to get the exact date on that um, is hard to do, but, but we have emails from Jerry about the board and it's um, one of three that he made for his buddies um, when they went to town. I don't know if you had a chance to take a look or did you do the work on that board? Yeah, I, I actually did the work on that. So I, I'm surprised that board's in this auction because the guy who owned it, I'm, you know, I, I didn't think you'd ever let this board go because it was basically a, a family heirloom, this board. What it was, was a friend of Jerry's. This is when Jerry had, Brewer had started to teach uh, Jerry how to shape. And I think it was in 67. And uh, the, what they call the mini guns had come into vogue at that stage. Like I said, McTavish had influenced everybody. Probably early 68 is when I'm going to guess that board was made. And Jerry had a place up in Wahiwa that, that was a friend of his dad owned the place and said, yeah, you guys can make boards in there. And basically it was a warehouse in Wahiwa. And they set up a little shop and making boards. And this guy named Don Green, who used to be a really, really good surfer. He rode for Velzy uh, back in the 60s. And, and a couple, and went, I think he rode for Hobie after that. He asked, and, and boards were getting short. And he was a, a school buddy of Jerry's. And he asked Jerry to make him a board. And I think it's the third board that Jerry shaped. So it's really, really rare. And what was really neat, it had the typical pintail, kind of wide point forward, uh, pocket rocket is what they called them in those days. And Jerry glassed it himself and did sort of a psychedelic splash job on the deck. And he wrote, love Jerry and a couple other little items under there. So this is, you know, this is like finding an early Picasso or something where, you know, you see this is where he started from. And uh, 
the fin had been broken off. So it came to me, uh, we put the fin back on and, it, and the bottom had been sitting outdoors, just cooking in the sun. And it was kind of a lime green, kind of a weird color green, because that's what Jerry glassed it with. And so we basically just sanded it and, you know, recolored it the exact same color, put the fin on. And the deck is all original and you can see all the writing and the color on the deck. So somebody who's a Lopez aficionado and wants something really kind of uniquely different than a, a normal lightning bolt. This is Jerry in his early days for sure. Yeah, it's cool, board. And, and one more thing, I'll leave you with this. I, I'm a huge um, believer because we started this conversation with, you know, what's the the most valuable board in the marketplace? And um, and there's opinions either way. I, I'm of the my personal thing, and and I don't have one of these boards, and I don't have one in the auction either, but. When I get my hands on them, I, I kind of freak out a little bit. And that's the Kivlin chip. I know we touched on it earlier, but I feel like the Matt Kivlin chip is like holy grail. There's not a lot of them. He became an architect. There's scarcity there. There's tons of cultural and, and historical significance and um, certainly cool uh, fin designs that he had on his boards. Uh, your thoughts on the Kivlin chip as, as maybe the most valuable surfboard in the marketplace probably not but I, i'm my hardest I, I i think if you clarify that as far as being the california design i think i agree with you one of the we had a kivlin ship back in my auction back in the early 2000s and it was balsa and it was in really good shape and that's when matt was still alive and i the fin had been replaced by a d fin and i knew it was the wrong fin because you could see it was a crappy layup and I got hold of Matt. I said, Matt, you know, and he goes, no, no, that's not my fin. You know, somebody put that thing on there. He sent me the, uh, a, a fin that the template was so progressive. It, you could use it on, on today's boards on a single fin. And he sent me the fin. We changed the fin out, put it on there. And that board in my auction sold for $39,000. It was a beautiful, you know, really good shape. And the, the thing is, Kivlin surfed. And he made boards for guys like Dora and, and some other people at Malibu. And so one, the canvas of having Malibu to work off of, having riders ride your boards, and then he, he himself was a good surfer as well. And then he worked with Quig as well. So the two of them combining. So if you you think about it, they were making Simmons's boards in the late 40s, early 50s, and then basically 50s came along and everybody went into balsa. And, you know, Matt made, I don't know how many he would have made, not that many, obviously he wasn't production shaping, but if you can find a Kivlin Malibu chip, it defines an error, it defines it in the timeline, as I was talking earlier on, of what surfboard design is, I think you're right. From a California perspective, he is one of the top three guys that you want to have. I think Quig for sure, Kivlin for sure. And if you want to go back earlier, you know, Simmons as well, but that's a little more into the forties and fifties. I think those guys made the best balsa boards. And then, you know, from a production point of view, you had Hobie making thousands, you know, really got into production and, you know, Velzi as well. So if you can find a designer like a Downing, a Kivlin, a Quig, and they got a balsa, especially if it's more, not so much a chip. I think once again, that clarifies it as a collectible, um, California board, you know, in my opinion, being from Hawaii, I'd rather have a, you know, a gun of some sort because that's going to be even more rare, but I think you pegged it that, uh, you know, Kivlin is one of the unsung heroes. That's probably one of the highly collectible world ones. Well, let me ask you this because I've seen uh, Gary Linden has a California chip, a fifties Malibu chip. We don't know if it's a Kivlin. It feels like it could be a Kivlin. There's no logos on anything. Kivlin Kivlin did. They didn't have logos. No. And so, you know, Gary and I were going back and forth. I, go, I, I mean, I think it's a Kivlin, but how do you like, I sense that if, if you walked into Gary's shop and you looked at this board, you'd be able to go, cause you're such an expert. I think you'd be able to go. Yeah. You know what? And a lot of times you can tell by the fin. Now this is one of those ones that the fin was replaced. The fin broke off or whatever. And right. somebody put a shitty fin on it. You can just tell, you know, I'm lucky. I've been in the industry now for 65 years and I started working when I was 14 years old. I've worked, I've literally looked at tens of thousands of surfboards. I mean, I've had them come through my hands, you know, working in the shops, you know, I had, I, and I've worked with all these different guys at one time or another. And so I have the luxury of having a, a kind of a data base in my brain of, of all these designs. So I usually can tell pretty good who it is, but once again, there was no labels back in those days. They, you know, 
commercial labels didn't really come in until Velzy Jacob started, you know, putting them on and Hobie started, you know, getting away from a, a rubber stamp and, and doing an actual laminate. So those guys, and the other thing was, you know, they were making boards and they were just trying to make a buck. I mean, they weren't, you know, they were just trying to stay alive and make surfboards as a living. So it is sometimes hard to tell. And a lot of times there's a lot of unscrupulous collectors out there or not hucksters, I should say, that are trying to sell to collectors. And you have to be, you know, buyer beware for sure. So unless you can have really somebody authenticate it, you're going to have to be a buyer's beware type of scenario. And you have to say, well, it's purported to be, or we think it may be, but we don't have a guarantee unless you got photos or written proof or somebody to authenticate it. So well, in the collector market, that's all I can tell people, you know, do your homework and uh, hope for the best. Well, you'll have to, you'll have to take a peek at, at Gary's board because I'm, it feels like a Kivlin, <laughs> but whatever that means. And I've seen you know, a few, you know, I've seen, I've seen them at the surfing heritage. I've seen a few Kivlins. In well, fact, both time, the museums. I, Go ahead. Next time I come to Cali, I'll, I'll take a look. And, you know, you were talking about good shapers. There's a classic example. I think Gary Linden is one of the California's best shapers in the modern era. And, you know, he paid his dues, did his chops working under everybody else, and then finally came out with his own. So in my opinion, and he's he's he actually looks like one of the guys from the 50s you know he's humble he's quiet he doesn't beat his chest and yet he makes an insane surfboard so i think some of the linden especially when he, those argavi ones and the ones that he's made out of wood they're those are modern collectibles in my opinion yeah and he, he's making me an agave right now so oh, nice. i'm looking forward to it uh look we've said a lot randy we've um, talked about a lot is there anything that that you want to touch on that I haven't um, brought up here? No, I think what, you know, people sometimes say, you know, what's a, what's a deal with these surfboard auctions? And I say, well, it's no different than a car auction. It brings enthusiasts together under one roof. And a lot of people don't have time to go out and beat the payment or look on Craigslist or, you know, go to garage sales or do all that. So somebody that has the means and the interest to come and go online on an auction, like, like the California gold auction, I think it's a great marketplace if you're an enthusiast, if you're a fan, and if you appreciate the history of our sport, and obviously if you can afford it, um, if you can, you know, go out there and and really and think about it, try to go out and find 50 boards that are collectible. It isn't easy. It's a lot of work, as you know, and I know, you know, we, we put a lot of time into this, but it's a passion that those that are into the marketplace really love. So I think, if you want to know about history and you want to see something, you know, this is a good place to find it all in one place at one time for sure. So I, I appreciate the effort that you do to put the California gold auction on. And, you mm -hmm. know, like I said, I did 10 years worth of auctions myself back in the day and uh, it ain't easy finding all that stuff, but it sure is fun when we do. Now you, you told me uh, that you were going to put some of your information from your auctions online. Is it too early to talk about that? No, I just, this week actually uh, launched um, randyrarick.com, just R-A-N-D-Y-R-A-R-I-C-K. Only one R, everybody puts two in, but it's only one R. I just launched it this week. And what I did is I spent about a year compiling all the photos, information, pricing, descriptions on uh, the 10 years worth of auctions I did in the early 2000s from 2001 through 2011. So anybody who wants to look up that information, it's now available and it's free, doesn't cost anything. And you can go to randyrick.com and the uh, the site's up and running, just, just launched this week. So I'm pretty stoked and uh, I'm going to start linking like to California Gold and yourself and, and other people to broaden, you know, my idea is make the pie bigger. Let's get all these collectors together and people who have boards, even if they're not selling them, it doesn't matter. You know, let people know what they're they're all about because it's our history. And there are some killer boards out there still. And it's fun to find them too. And, you know, that that's the other thing is people come to me all the time and want to get boards restored. And I specialize in glass off restorations is what I like to do. But I'm glad to give uh, free uh, appraisals to people and, and occasionally... If you got something out there, you know, dig it out from the garage or in, in the attic and uh, let's see what you got. Yeah, good stuff. Well, randyrarick.com sounds like a great resource for all of us. And um, I look forward to perusing your site. And it's good talking with you as always, Randy. And I appreciate your help and we'll chat soon. It's my pleasure and uh, good luck with the California Gold. Thank you, buddy. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.